Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. No, this is not cabaret, it's Think About It, a podcast about the power of ideas and how language can change the world, with Uli Baer. Why does America think so differently about speech than the rest of the world? Today I will be joined by Professor Julie Suk. She was until very recently Professor of Law at the Benjamin Cardozo School of Law at Yeshiva University in New York City and is starting this fall, 2018, as the Dean for Master's Programs and a Professor of Sociology at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Professor Suk is an expert in comparative equality law. She graduated from Harvard University with a BA with a law degree from Yale University and a Doctor in Philosophy in Politics from Oxford University. Great. I'm so excited today to welcome Professor Julie Suk at the Cardozo Law School here in New York City. We're actually sitting in Professor Suk's office for the podcast Unmuted on Free Speech and all of its variations. Professor Suk is a scholar who's interested in equality and anti-discrimination norms in different legal contexts and has done work in different countries with different constitutions. And I'm really interested in speaking with you, Julie, because I think there's a very deep understanding that freedom of expression is obviously the bedrock of our American way of thinking about ourselves as having particular freedoms. The reason why I was reminded when I walked into the building and on the window outside, there's a quote from Supreme Court Justice Benjamin Cardozo, as you probably see, because you see it every day when you go to work. And it says, it's a very short quote, freedom of expression is the matrix, the indispensable condition of nearly every other form of freedom, unquote. So Supreme Court Justice Cardozo was justice in the 1930s, before him Oliver Wendell Holmes, after him Felix Frankfurter, so a giant in American jurisprudence who kind of reminds you every morning when you walk into this building, <laughs> freedom of expression is the matrix and the indispensable condition. Isn't that just enough then to sort of assume you say, yes, amen, we agree with that, <laughs> let's move on. <laughs> so I'm curious... Given the, all the attention in this country right now in the last couple of years, especially last two years maybe, on freedom of expression, freedom of speech, on campus, in football stadiums, on Twitter, mm -hmm. by celebrities, even with our president. Yesterday I talked to your colleague Kate Shaw, who is quite interested mm -hmm. in studying the speech of the president, yes. where it has legal implications versus political reach. Mm -hmm. How do you approach this such a statement, which is by an American... Mm -hmm. Supreme Court Justice, who says it is the indispensable condition of every other form of freedom. I think in the American mindset, starting with the First Amendment, when we talk about freedom of expression or even every other form of freedom, we're talking about freedom from intrusions by the state. And then even though we sometimes talk about freedom of ex expression on campus, when in fact the intrusions are not about the state, we still sort of import this idea that uh, freedom, the freedom of expression we're talking about um, is a freedom from that interference by some form of authority rather than a different idea of freedom of expression that has more to do with individual self-development. And I think that in the American context, it's really about this skepticism of state power that really defines our commitment to free expression. And you think it's motivated by a kind of need to be independent and free from government interference from a kind of too powerful government sort of weighing yes. down on us, rather than this intrinsic idea that freedom of expression is a kind of innate right or something that human beings need to flourish. There are other philosophical conceptions that make freedom right. of expression enter into a legal concept at all, so they just say freedom of expression is a fundamental human need. I don't think that in the jurisprudential development of freedom of speech in the United States, that that idea has been the one driving the jurisprudence or even driving the discourse, the judicial discourse around free expression. I think it's more a certain theory of the state and the state not determining 
too much how individuals live their lives and express their views. And that's why the First Amendment is probably a restriction on the government. Yes. It's supposed to leave us alone and do what we want to do, and the government should not be given too much power and authority. Yes. So the government gives itself a kind of rule to actually not overstep its own bounds. And yeah. And and it's not just the First Amendment that is, I think, in the United States. And this is something that's different from other constitutional traditions. All the constitutional rights that are articulated in our Bill of Rights are rights against the state. And even when they're not particularly identified as rights against the state, it's the idea that the rights that we have are there to prevent the ex excessive power of the state, I think, continues. Could there be other conceptions of writing a constitution? If we think of a constitution in a more general sense, not as our particular legal document, but as a group of people coming together to give themselves some rules by which to live together. Could there be another approach, as you said, th that's mm -hmm. driven not by, let's guard against the state's overreach or overuse mm -hmm. of its incredibly extreme possible of possibility of exercising power? Yeah, even constitutional rights that are articulated in other traditions are articulated not merely as enforceable trumps against the government, but as instructions to the legislature to implement certain policies or to realize certain ideals. And can you explain how that would work out if someone thought of the Constitution in a different way, if it wasn't, this is our way in which mm -hmm. we kind of stay safe from the government's overreach, but to conceptualize it differently, and how does it, does it play out differently than actually in societies? So I think a good example is how we think about equality in constitutions, right? So in the United States, we have the 14th Amendment, which says that no state shall deprive someone, uh, persons of equal protections of the laws. When you bring up the conception of equality, equality is kind of a determining factor or consideration in how one thinks of rights and developing a constitution. You said in other constitutions, maybe equality is a good place to start to think about yes. how we give rights or how we restrict the government, for example, to infringe on our rights. Yeah, if you think about our constitutional guarantee of equality, it is framed as no state shall deprive any person of equal protection of the laws, whereas in other constitutional traditions, there might just be a guarantee of equal rights. And a good example is the way in which gender equality is framed in the German constitution in Article 3 of the Basic Law, where basically it says that men and women shall have equal rights. And a 1994 amendment to the German Constitution not only says men and women shall have equal rights, but that the state shall promote the actual implementation of equal rights between men and women and eradicate disadvantages that now exist. I'm raising yeah. my eyebrows. I'm looking at you thinking, I, yeah. I should know this. I'm aware of yeah. this. And I grew up in Germany part of my life a while ago. but. Is there anything comparable in our Constitutional Bill of Rights that even addresses gender? You said men and women should have equal rights. That's yeah. in the German Constitution, in the Basic Law, as they call it yeah. over there. Is there anything in, our, in the American Constitution that... Well, it's complicated in the U.S., and this is something that I'm writing about right now. So, as you might know, we had a movement to put gender equality yes. in the Constitution that failed in 1982, and there's been a bit of a revival now, because even after the deadline to ratify the ERA, two states after Trump was elected and after the Women's March, two states have then tried to ratify the ERA. And so it's opening up that debate a little bit. Technically, uh, how many states would be needed or how does ratification of such an amendment work? So under Article 5, you need three quarters mm -hmm. of all the states. And today that would mean 38 states, 35 states ratified before the official deadline. And then Nevada and Illinois just ratified last year. So if we got one more, I mean, there are some interesting questions about what would happen after the deadline. But the point here is that whether, so one of the debates around gender equality is that it's not needed. A constitutional amendment is not needed because through jurisprudence developed by the Supreme Court, we've extended the Equal Protection Clause to prohibit sex discrimination by the state. But the point here is that even the Equal Protection Clause, whether it protects against race discrimination or sex discrimination, has always been understood as a right against the state rather than a general guarantee of equal outcomes or equal conditions or the possibility of citizens equally enjoying the rights and privileges that are guaranteed 
if, within the Constitution. And secondly, wouldn't there be a difference as a non-lawyer when there's an, an amendment in the Constitution rather than the jurisprudence and the record of the Supreme Court's decisions that give me enough assurance and as a yeah. citizen to think I'm confident this court has interpreted it in the following way, the 14th Amendment, which was ratified I think 150 years ago this yeah. month, actually. Yeah. I don't think we'll have a big anniversary celebration in Washington, D.C. <laughs> this year. It's a <laughs> critical moment in American history. But yeah. can we rely on the Supreme Court's jurisprudence and say they've actually moved in the right direction on this, and I'll be confident it'll stay like this for another 100 years. I don't need an amendment to enshrine this. Isn't the amendment, does it have more weight beyond l legal weight, also a symbolic weight and political weight that it then sits in our Constitution? So, it's actually complicated <laughs> because we do have the jurisprudence, and it is true that the Supreme Court can overturn its jurisprudence, and that might be a reason why you'd want a sex equality amendment. I don't. I think that the protection against sex discrimination is so deeply entrenched now that even with the turn that the court is going to take in a more conservative direction. I don't really see a conservative court saying sex equality is no longer implied in the Equal mm -hmm. Protection Clause. So I'm not quite worried about that. And much of the writing that I've been doing about gender equality and why the amendment is needed is not really about distrusting the court as giving an opportunity to judges who want to do something more than what courts have already done. Okay. Right? Because what the jurisprudence says is that there's a prohibition of sex discrimination. right? right. But, and this is, we can talk more about this, but it takes us a little bit but farther it, afield from... Right, I'm uh, interested in one point you just made yeah. a couple of times. So d d can you say, what is the difference between an equality guarantee mm -hmm. versus protection against discrimination? Is that, I understand, do yeah. I understand that correctly? So how would you describe in sort of, in more general terms, what is an equality guarantee that is not just, the state must not do these bad things to us, but there's a guarantee? Okay, so I think that whether or not you see something as simply a prohibition of discrimination versus a guarantee of equality, the best example is probably affirmative action, either race-based or gender-based, right? So if you think that affirmative action is itself a form of discrimination and therefore is illegal <laughs> under the Equal Protection Well, we have class, a few lawsuits right? yeah, absolutely. aiming at universities right now, which we've had for many right. years since. So that's actually in the university, that's a really big concern. Right. right? Yeah, right. Uh, but if you think about a constitutional guarantee of equality as simply prohibiting discrimination, understood formally as distinguishing between black and white or distinguishing between men and women, then affirmative action becomes conceptually an illegal form of discrimination. Right? But if you think of constitutional guarantee of equality as encompassing the principle of equal citizenship, right? and so then the legislature or a state university has a program in which they distinguish between men and women for the purposes of promoting women's inclusion or promoting the inclusion of a disadvantaged or disfavored group, right? that might formally look like discrimination on the basis of race or discrimination right. on the basis of sex, but it becomes an implementation of the principle of equal rights. And this debate is like what I've just said is a distilled version of what has happened in European constitutional orders around the question of gender and the permissibility of gender quotas, both for political office uh, and for university admissions and for corporate boards of directors, right? Because if you have a gender quota, and this is very much what the struggle in Germany was about right. leading to the 94 amendment with very clear language that says not only that men and women are equal in rights, but then adds a sentence in 1994 uh, saying that the state shall promote the actual implementation of men and women and eradicate disadvantages. Right. My head's kind exist. of spinning and I'm thinking if such a sentence could be in one of our amendments, I just can't imagine the state must, you tell me again what the, what the German 1994 law says, that the state must support or must actually act on this. Yeah. So that's a directive to the state, not yeah. in a negative sense to not do right. bad things, but to say uh, the state must actually do yeah. good things and and if this, you value this kind of thing. Absolutely. Uh, and then you also have, um, you could look at the French Constitution too. We get an amendment in 2008 that says not only that everyone is equal, but also that the state shall promote, legislation shall promote the equal access by men and women to positions of social and professional responsibility. And that's a sentence that makes clear that if the state adopts a law requiring corporate boards to be gender balanced, thereby making distinctions of gender in right. the law. 
if, if that's a, a way of promoting equal access to positions of professional and social responsibility, it's not a violation of the freestanding constitutional guarantee of equality. As you just said, that then there's this shift in many European constitutional orders where we distinguish between rights that are enforceable by individuals and rights or values or principles that, are, that function more as directives to the legislature than right. as individually enforceable rights. And that is a very sophisticated understanding of rights, not simply as something individuals can assert, but embedded in a system of values and principles that the constitutional order should promote. That's something that we don't really, I think, practice in American constitutionalism. And it's largely driven by this idea that a right is not positive, that it's largely a negative right against the state. And that brings us back to how we think about free speech rights as well. So, so we're thinking about freedom from state intrusion, and we don't think about the extent to which people's speech and ability to express their political views is impeded by the influence of money in politics. Interesting. Right? Well, so yeah. my ability to speak is increasingly impeded by my inability to access certain platforms or inability to influence the political process. Let me just ask you, yeah. isn't Citizens United the case that empowers you greatly because just have a lot of money and spend it in an election. That is your expression of your political opinion, right? Depends so. who you are, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Well, it's interesting. That's, that is considered yeah. a neutral decision, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Floyd Abrams, one of the great, you know, the eminence grise of First Amendment, right? He actually argued that case, Citizens United, and he thinks, yes, giving money is a form of political expression, therefore must not be restricted. Right. And you're that saying, well, if I restricted. don't have all this money, then yeah. it's uneven or unequal. Or, or, but people think, well, that's neutrality, right? Whether you have money or Absolutely. not, that's up to you. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> this is an interesting point. Well, if we really believed that the reason free expression is valuable is that each human being has a right to the development of his personhood, to realize his full potential and his full participation in political life, then I think we would be concerned with much more than intrusions that come from state regulation. Well, it's interesting you started out in what you just said. If we actually are concerned that every human being, every citizen has the right to develop his or her own version of what they consider their best form of life, that actually they're entitled to that. Mm -hmm. But do we enfranchise that in a way? Do we actually allow that to happen if there are things that work against it? Equality in an interesting way, I've noticed this, is a lot of writing about free speech, especially on campus, mm -hmm. avoids the word equality. I can actually show yeah. you, I have five <laughs> books on my desk right now, I'm reviewing really incredibly powerful, important books. Timothy Garton Ash wrote a great book with the Yale University Press, it's a global comparative study of free speech. The word equality does not show up in the index and does not show up in the book. And it's an interesting phenomenon to me that you can write an entire book on free speech and not mention equality because of the point you just made. If we assume that everybody has the right to flourish and develop themselves on their own terms, then everybody should have equal standing once they get to this free speech moment. Yeah. Or is it the other way around? Is it how, how do you approach it from which angle? So the link between free speech and equality seems to me quite critical. Mm -hmm. When I read the Washington Post and the New York Times, I will bet you eight times out of 10 it's framed as it's speech versus offended feelings. It's mm -hmm. never about equality. Right, right. It's made into a subjective experience. It's people feel bad, it's tough, it's things they don't want to hear, they're controversial or they disagree with them, and we really can't just keep people from not hearing those things. That's just the breaks. Yeah, so we've talked so far about this contrast between freedom from state intrusion and freedom to develop your personality through expression. But I also think there's free speech as it relates to participation in the democratic process and having a voice in the democratic process, not only for your own sake, but also to make sure that the democratic process actually leads to de collective decision-making that represents the what will of the people and is well-informed and well-deliberated. And if we actually take that seriously as well, we would worry deeply, not only about state intrusion, but about having equal concern and respect so that they can feel empowered to speak within the political process. We must take that seriously, especially in a country such as the United States. The pluralism of all of us mm -hmm. depends on the fact that everybody can participate because it's not going to just be one way of thinking and one yeah. majority. We have many different people, many different backgrounds, many different life expectations, experiences. So James Madison in Federalist Papers, he says in Federalist 55, he says, 
freedom of speech has to be guaranteed and of course there are going to be some bad actors in it, people who are saying yeah. things that are not good, which in another constitution would say they're anti-democratic or they actually threaten the entire edifice. They actually are, let's yeah. say, you're going against the constitution. If I say stand up here and go to the Supreme Court and say I want to abolish the Supreme Court, how does the Supreme Court regulate my speech? So Madison says, but ultimately on balance, we think in America they are more good people than bad people. <laughs> It'll kind of win out. Right. And he's not naive at all. And he's not actually, you yeah. know, sort of thinking the arc of history, which not that Dr. King was naive at all. This has always right. been toward justice. But he says, there's no other way of regulating this. Right. Because you just said political participation depends on everybody participating. So how do you assure that there aren't ways in which some people become disenfranchised systematically? in yeah. the name of free speech. Yeah. Well, I think it is a difficult problem because on the one hand, we think we can distinguish between good speech and bad speech, but when you look at right now what's going on with the rise of populist nationalism in Europe, people like Viktor Orban in Hungary, what's really remarkable about the rise of populist nationalism is that they appropriate the rhetoric of constitutionalism <laughs> and rights, right? They don't just do, they amend the Constitution. <laughs> they embrace, at least on paper, change by law. And that's a very interesting thing because what it shows is that in a pluralistic society, you don't know who's going to have power and then define what good speech and bad speech is. And so this gets back to, I think, what we were talking about with regard to the slippery slope. We're worried that if we empower the state to express a view and express a strong view promoting the equality of women, if there's a shift in power, and so those who don't believe in the equality of women then get inherit a jurisprudence of gender equality, they can use that rhetoric in many ways to actually oppress women. And we know that a lot of the words that we use in the Constitution are indeterminate, including equality or even gender equality or non-discrimination on the basis of sex, non-discrimination on the basis of race. So I think that in a pluralistic society, the fear of power shifting and leading to completely unintended consequences is very real. So where's the starting point of such an analysis? Since you could also say, well, we can worry about the slippery slope, which really kind of means that judges and justices and legislators after us won't be thinking they'll just mm -hmm. enact automatically by road some mechanism. It's a slippery slope, like this kind of feeling that nobody acts anymore. There are no human beings. It's, just, it's inevitable. Not many things are inevitable in human actions, so there's still actions involved. But let's just assume this could be right. So you could flip it and say, in the name of gender equality, we're doing this, and other people become powerful, and they're going to reverse it and go the other direction. Yeah. But if you're starting in the position saying, currently we don't have equality, yeah. because the status quo is actually not a balanced playing field and equality is already here, then people can say, well, let's try it for, or give it a run and see how it goes. And maybe actually for the first time, you know, yeah. for example, women will be participating in board meetings or, you know, in law schools or in government or be at the court or in legislatures. So if you s start by saying the status quo isn't already the best possible world, yeah. Then you can start tinkering. Yeah. And is the is the fear really that it will go in the wrong direction? Does it justify leaving things the way they are? I think that's a political question, not a legal question. Yeah. So I don't think there's any consensus, though. First, I don't think there's a consensus on whether the status quo is good. But even if there was a consensus on that, I think there's a lack of consensus, even on the left, and even amongst those who uh, believe that we, we should be doing more to achieve gender equality, for example. I don't think there's a consensus as to which forms of gender inequality are the most egregious and require our most serious attention today. And that's part of the problem. I think it, it is that conversation of, is there is there equality? I think you can listen to a lot of people in America today who would say that question is so absurd on its face. Is mm -hmm. it, the way look around, uh, there's no equality, and then there's all different sorts of different There's economic inequality, there's yes. gender inequality, there's maybe race-based inequality, there's socioeconomic, educational, there are all these right, things. Right, absolutely. There. So I think it's also very hard for Americans to say, well, there's inequality that we have to fix because there's so many other dimensions that would influence someone's participation in a society. 
Yeah, well, there are many axes of inequality, but that's part of the problem, too, that sometimes when we talk about, for example, racial inequality, and we want to fix it or try to reduce it by, for example, having race-based affirmative action in universities to promote the inclusion of disadvantaged races. One of the critiques of that, though, is that at least at elite institutions, affirmative action based on race leads to the inclusion of the more privileged racial minorities, that is, those who are well-educated and integrated into middle-class neighborhoods or private schools. That critique sometimes comes from those who are concerned with socioeconomic inequality and the failure of elite universities to fully integrate and embrace socioeconomic integration. Right. Universities are kind of in the hot spot of these debates. Yeah. As, as we know, there's a, a case being brought against Harvard College or Harvard University for, yeah. you know, for using what people consider inappropriate categories, which is racial identity and their admissions process. Mm-hmm. It's sort of lifting the cover on this very secretive, strange process of admissions yeah. and sort of claiming there's something wrong here. Universities are also in, in the spotlight on the speech issue. And if yeah. we go back for a moment to Justice Cardozo's quote, you know, free speech is the indispensable foundation yeah. or the matrix of nearly every other form of freedom. When you walk into this law school, you would think, well, this is the place where you really cannot regulate speech at all, and you must not, because it's a law school yeah. carrying the name of the man who said this is the, the, the bedrock, the basis of all mm-hmm. other freedoms. What's your sense? Why do these controversies flare up, and why do they capture the nation's imagination in such powerful ways? Because of the idea of academic freedom, universities are supposed to be places where there's a free exchange of ideas and hopefully all perspectives. But at the same time, universities already do highly regulate speech. We make choices about what to teach. We make choices about which scholars to hire. Right. Right. And we make value judgments about what kind of work is yeah. <laughs> worth doing. I've, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've tried unsuccessfully to get an appointment in the law school here, and you <laughs> wouldn't hire me. You think you're a nice person to talk to? <laughs> I'm not qualified. Can I bring my First Amendment rights and marshal a bunch of lawyers and sue you for not giving me a lecture hall to go forth on the First or Fourteenth or any amendment? No. Well, (laughs) yeah. I mean, this is very difficult because also it's, you know, these are highly competitive environments, right? But we make choices all the time, value judgments, right, about what's good speech and bad speech, what's good scholarship and bad scholarship. So those have value judgments, not legal judgments necessarily, right? So they're actually by experts kind of group of expertise. So it's not, strictly speaking, legal judgments to say... Well, it's not legal judgments in the sense that, for example, I mean, and I think it goes behind who we decide to hire in law schools or in any university setting, because there are so many qualified people who do good legal analysis, but we have to decide both. We make decisions all the time about which fields of law we're going to prioritize over others, right? right? Are we going to have more people working in business law this year? or more people working in public law or poverty law, right? right? So we make those kinds of judgments all the time before we even meet particular scholars. And then when we do meet particular scholars, we have to decide what research questions are worth focusing on. And on the one hand, we say that they're not driven by political ideology. Very often, though, it's very difficult to separate out questions of ideology and values from the determinations that we make, in the, because it's in the nature. That is, we, we deal with legal questions that are immensely intertwined with our system of values and principles. And so, so I do think that it's unavoidable that in any university setting, we're constantly making judgments about speech. But on the other hand, when we make those judgments and someone questions those judgments, right? So we make a decision to invite a certain speaker. Right. And a student says that speaker engages in scholarship that is driven by an ideology that we find offensive or problematic. I think what students mean to say is not just it's offensive, but that they disagree with the decision that this is academically worthwhile or good research, right? That has been made by the university. But interestingly, the conflict often plays out as we're engaged in free speech and then those who question the judgment are against free speech. And I think that's an incorrect way of thinking about the problem. Because how could we say someone gets invited, that's an exercise of free speech on behalf of that inviting group or the faculty or administration or whoever invited, and then people who are 
speaking out against that invitation, they're also exercising their free speech. You think mm -hmm. that's a great Madisonian moment, and then everybody is as a kind of raucous debate. Of course, well, Madison didn't have everybody debating. <laughs> well, I think we often imagine an ideal situation of everyone exercising free speech. as So we imagine it to go something like this. The speaker comes and speaks, and instead of protesting the event, the students show up and raise their hands when the time comes and ask challenging questions, <laughs> and then we have a really great, robust debate, right? That's how it's supposed to go in the university setting. And I think part of the reason it doesn't go that way is that sometimes those who hold a, a viewpoint that goes against the university or goes against the decisions that have been made don't feel empowered to express their views in that setting. Or they think that by showing up and asking a question, one might say that one is condoning or at least not questioning the assumption that the speaker has a body of research worth engaging with. Is and that is a value determination that has already been made when someone gets invited to speak in an academic forum. And so there is a way in which to protest that one is saying something somewhat different from what could possibly be said if you show up and raise your hand and engage in a robust debate of the sort that Right. ideally imagine, yeah. right? That it, and I do think that it's, that universities do make judgments, and not all of these judgments are highly controversial ones, but I think some of them will sit on the line, right? There are some people whose work sits on the line between scholarship and ideological activism, and sometimes when students think that the university has made the wrong call in categorizing, then there's so much they can express by showing up and asking questions about the work. It's actually, <laughs> so, this links to a theoretical point you made, and it's yeah. a different context. So in this context where you've studied laws or rules regulating historiography around the Holocaust, whether Holocaust yeah. denial is permitted or not, you said it's not about restricting people mm -hmm. from publishing things that say the Holocaust didn't exist because such books exist. Actually, when I was in college, they were actually locked away in the library, and you had to yeah. ask for permission to read right. them, and then they were restored, and they had the record of who read them. Yeah. So they were considered so incendiary, which yeah. I remember there was a book, a Holocaust and I love, by someone named Zundel and Noam Chomsky wrote yeah. the preface in the 90s. And in college, I had to go and ask. And I felt very self-conscious yeah. reading this horrible incendiary you know, yeah. piece of historical garbage, really, scholarship, <laughs> they yeah. called it. So you said it's not to stop these people from existing or publishing because they're found in libraries, but it's actually for the state to express a value. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting when you go to the university, much smaller context, so say you invite somebody uncommon and unusual who would d say something that is on the level of denying that the Holocaust existed mm -hmm. or saying that slavery was actually kind of good for people. Right. You know, and I'm not making these things up. These things actually are right. in the discourse. You can go online. Mm -hmm. You can find them in one second. And the question then is, is the university saying, we don't want you here because you have no right to speak, mm -hmm. which would be conflicting with sort of Justice Cardozo's views, or rather, we don't want you here because we have other values, very strong ones, and mm -hmm. this goes so against our values, which is what your theoretical analysis has said, this is Holocaust denial is not this simplistic way of saying those people must be shut down and can't exist, but yeah. the state expresses itself in this way. Yeah. So I think of Holocaust denial laws as cut of the same cloth as other collective memory practices around uh, the Holocaust. So one thing that you'll notice, and I've spent a lot of time in France, is that every time you go to a school, it's quite common that they'll have a plaque there, if it was a school from which children were deported, right. commemorating the fact that children were deported because they were Jewish. And there are plaques that say that, and you can see them every day that you drop off your kid at the school. Right. And there, the state is speaking. <laughs> and Interesting, and marking. And telling you to remember. And it's right? And I don't think Holocaust denial laws are about trying to stamp out the speech or to suppress it, because mo a lot of people in France know that such views exist. It's not to try to protect people from the existence of those views, but it's really to tell people that the law is expressive. That is, the law is not just a set of rules about do's and don'ts. The law also tries to persuade and educate people, and I think Holocaust denial laws are an exercise in that function of law. That's really helpful because I find that a lot of people think Holocaust denial laws are really to sort of stop those people. Censorship. From censorship <laughs> and right. because it's so offensive. 
Right. Where actually, the strange thing is, and this was a kind of a, a, a very big thing in the 90s, really unfortunate thing, and, uh, and it wasn't a matter of being offended. There were survivors who would come to these events and confront people who denied the Holocaust. It's not that they were mm -hmm. sort of scared and cowed and traumatized. They were actually there speaking out and saying, this is my own experience. So in some ways, it wasn't a matter of offense. Mm -hmm. But it's characterized in America that a lot of times it's, it's censorship, it's wrong, the state shouldn't censor mm -hmm. anybody, and not to coddle people against mm -hmm. these offensive viewpoints. Yeah. So you're saying it's expressing something. So what the university expresses itself all the time. Mm -hmm. As you said, in hiring and appointing and all sorts of and putting right. slogans on their windows, <laughs> you know right. they have. I mean, they have a value. So they're speaking to Fifth Avenue every single day, right. so, you know, maybe a couple hundred thousand people in, in a week. And so, would such a rule, for example, in on a campus, which are so controversial and so difficult to even conceive and have been struck down so many times, to say you can't come to this campus and hold this or that view? And I know we're going into yeah. viewpoint neutrality, all this, but in some ways it would express a value, you're saying, mm -hmm. rather than just censor somebody. So l let me make sure I understand mm -hmm. the hypothetical that like I'm you're saying, putting on let's the say table. Your books can be in the library, yeah. but you as a speaker, we don't invite you. We don't give you a, a space that's air conditioned with a platform and a podium, and we're not going to bring 500 students to listen to you. We have your books in the library. We have your videos. Yeah. You can watch them, no problem, but we don't endorse you because it looks too much like we condone your point of view. Yeah. And uh, you're saying this is controversial here. Very uh, controversial because yeah. the people who are in the headlines of the news are the people who make it their hobby or their actually their profession yeah. to provoke universities into saying, unless you invite me, you're violating my First Amendment rights. Yeah. I now have the Justice Department and the President behind me who have taken a position on this and said, should be the President Trump has said Berkeley doesn't host so and so. Yeah. Should let's cut federal funding. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of pressure on universities to say not make a mistake in this space and say, okay, we have values, this goes so fundamentally against our values, but we really don't want to take any step in the wrong direction, so we let them speak here. Yeah. Well I think it is very hard in a pluralistic society because we could imagine, and part of the reason I'm pressing you on the hypothetical, is that everyone could imagine a situation in which there is a speaker who really crosses the line, is really doing nothing that you would describe as having any academic merit, but rather is a firebrand engaging in an ideology that's contrary to the values of the university and the values of the constitutional order in which we live. Right. So I think everyone can sort of imagine that, but even people who might identify as members of the same political party or the same ideological stripe might imagine a different <laughs> place or a different character or a different speaker who meets that profile. But that's the problem, right? The fact that we have such a diversity right. of viewpoints, even amongst those who might share values and ideologies, suggests that we can't really trust ourselves. And I think as a result, people who are in leadership positions don't want to take the risk of getting it wrong. Right. Yeah, I mean, I wonder whether there are such values that actually everybody would agree with. So mm -hmm. I think, I mean, we have speakers who have come to campus who said they're in favor of a, a peaceful ethnic cleansing mm -hmm. of non-white people from America. I would think if I find somebody who disagrees and says, that's a reasonable position, I want to hear this one out, I would say not the value of any right. university I understand, just like the Catholic Church would say, mm -hmm. if you are a self-declared homosexual person, a gay person, e that goes against our value in certain ways, we will not ordain you, or we will, you mm -hmm. know, you can't have an official position in the, in, in the church, you probably right. can't even be a member of the community in the same way, so I think there's some lines that actually, they're very far out, right. <laughs> extreme, right. but we have extreme speakers in America. But speaking. I just think the reality is that typically these conflicts occur not over a speaker who explicitly <laughs> favors ethnic cleansing, but is often speaking a more civilized language, which I think if you put two and two together, it appears that they're condoning and yes. advocating just that. But I do think that the hypothetical that you give is unrealistic in the sense that I think most of the speakers about whom we have controversies 
are speaking a more coded. It's Richard uh, Spencer who wears yeah. polo shirts and khakis and has come to the University of Florida and then this is his quote, you know, mm -hmm. a, a kind of peaceful ethnic cleansing. So <laughs> so he said that. And in some yeah. ways the question is he won't say it maybe at the University of Florida, he said it elsewhere, so this complicated thing. Right. Is this his viewpoint or is right. this a tweet he did somewhere else? Didn't quite mean that. Was that ironic for you? Yeah. So the burden is on universities to determine to draw the line. I think the yeah. challenge is that there's another way to look at it, the, uh, that the other side, let's say the speakers, yeah. they're actually testing something else. They're not sort of promoting their ideas. They're actually testing the tolerance of the university or the, mm -hmm. the courage of the university to express its values. Yeah. Well, they're really, I mean, they're kind of thumbing their noses at us in a way. It's not that they're yeah. really invested in the university. They're actually invested in taking down the university's right. authority. Well, I think there is this narrative that's proliferated in the United States that the uni that universities have a very strong liberal bent and that somehow conservative views are underrepresented and therefore politically suppressed. Absolutely. And I think that that sort of drives this mm -hmm. idea that those who hold conservative views, if they are not represented, that there must be some kind of free speech problem. Right, and they are just the thin edge of the mm -hmm. whole movement. They're extremists maybe, and maybe as a regular conservative, I wouldn't endorse them either, but they're testing this and say, if they got mm -hmm. shut down, as you're saying, then soon fewer and fewer people from my side of the political spectrum will come. The concern is, I, I had a student ask me, they said, at a very large university in New York State before it became a law, all the bathrooms were declared gender neutral. Mm -hmm. So every bathroom had a sign that said, you can if you can use this ba bathroom according to your own self-declared gender identity. Mm -hmm. This was before it became mandated, was mandated by law. Mm -hmm. So it was a value. So wait, I'm sorry, they so were gender neutral bathrooms or they, they were, were gendered bathrooms, but everyone was correct. allowed to? They were gendered bathrooms, like, but they just I could put, use the men's room yes. or the, the genders were taken They off put a sign in front of them and said, yeah. anybody can use this bathroom, okay. really. So if you okay. felt like using the men's room today, you could use it, or you felt yeah. like using the women's room, you could use it. So it sort of made every yeah. bathroom kind of, you can use it according to what yeah. you think, not what we think. It was before it became a law in New York State to accommodate people to have gender right. neutral bathrooms. So they said, that's a, that's a value of the university. Yeah. So how can the university act in this way and put signs on probably literally 10,000 bathrooms, but then invite somebody who doesn't believe that transgendered people exist and denies mm -hmm. their existence and denies all their political rights, all their legal rights? So in some ways, they said there was a kind of conflict between the values of the university in this one area where they're yeah. expressing that and actually acting on it and actually spending money and resources, and the other area, and they're saying, it's not a balancing question, but we don't trust that you really mean this in the one area where you're mm -hmm. accommodating people in bathrooms. If you're inviting the speaker right. who holds this view that isn't just an opposing view, but actually says this doesn't even exist as a category. Right. Well, I think this gets back to the line that I think is hard to draw. So I think universities are definitely in the business of having values and having viewpoints, but then inviting those who disagree with those viewpoints to speak, right? This is the idea of having a robust exchange. And I think in many European countries that prohibit Holocaust denial, they take a view about the Holocaust and there's robust debate about people who have different views from the government as to the Holocaust, but then there's also this category, so extreme, that is denying the existence right. they're saying of it's the Holocaust a fact. <laughs> as being outside of the realm of that robust and reasonable right. Right. exchange of ideas, right? And so if we think about robust debate and then outside of that universe, that in the context of American universities, we try to, I think we try to maintain that but there is perhaps more disagreement about where to draw that line between right. what's right. within reasonable exchange of ideas, disagreement, discourse, and so extreme that we can't maintain our system of values if we allow that viewpoint to be part of the debate. Right. Uh, and I think it's possible that there's more agreement within other countries that tend to be, I don't know, I mean, I disagree with the characterization of European countries as being more homogeneous. I don't think they are, but I do think that the state is more confident about drawing that line, and I think here we're scared of drawing it 
for a variety of reasons. It's it's. I've had a lot of conversations now where this comes up and people say, a lot of people have said to me since I grew up partly in Germany, they said, well, you as a German, yeah. your speech has to be regulated yeah. because people like you committed vast crimes. And I was born in 1966, okay. in 1926. Yeah. So, but still they say, it's like your country needs that because you have these terrible atrocities in your past. Mm -hmm. We in America do not have <laughs> such an issue. That's actually a direct sentence in, in, yeah. in Floyd Davis' book on First Amendment. He said, in America, thankfully, we do not have such a history, so we have done much better by not regulating hate speech. And then yeah. I've had people say to me, well, slavery and the genocide of Native Americans was a race-based hate crime of vast yeah. proportions right. that doesn't have to be compared to the Holocaust and doesn't have to actually diminish yeah. the terrible significance of that and the incommensurate dimensions but it's another event yeah. that has to be acknowledged yeah. so I think a lot of the controversies in America are not really about Holocaust denial we don't have so many cases yeah. thank God because it's just no I, and I don't think we have the same practices around the collective memory of yeah. slavery the right so we don't have plaques in places where slaves were killed or mm -hmm. traded Right. Uh, that are in the public space and in the public consciousness. And you're saying there's a kind of continuum uh, that the law is a form of And we continue to have Confederate <laughs> monuments <laughs> right. instead, right? right? But I think it's not a coincidence that this is what gave rise to the controversy in Charlottesville. But um, then so that we have contested practices yeah. around collective memory, but I don't think we've ever gotten to the point on slavery where the state or subdivisions of the state speak very loudly about morally condemning the slavery that occurred. And now I'm not just talking about the state. I mean, one thing that you can do, and I don't know if you've ever done this, is you could go visit the South and go on tours of plantations. And it is very interesting to see how slavery is represented on the plantation tours because so much of the plantation tour focuses on the lifestyle of the very wealthy plantation <laughs> owners and the mansions and the parties that they had. And sometimes they will have slave cabins and they'll talk about them, but interestingly, they say slavery was a bad institution, but the slaves on this plantation were, but were quite happy. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> our, this slave master was very kind to his slaves, right? And I've heard that at several plantations that I've visited in the South. I don't know. I haven't visited all of them, so right. I don't know if that's the narrative. Whether all the slaves were considered to be relatively happy. Yeah, maybe those are the only the ones that stay, <laughs> yeah, stay that's open. Interesting. Right. But I think also now if you yeah. visit, you could also visit some of the plantations of our founding fathers like you could right. visit Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. Monticello you could visit Montpelier which is James Madison's yeah. estate and there's a slave cemetery there that yeah. you could visit and I think it's it's more recently now due to scholarly work yeah. that that you're seeing a real opening up of the representation of slavery insights of American history and a full acknowledgement but even then, it's just an opening up of narratives and information. So now we have more information about Thomas Jefferson's relationship to his slaves. But I, I don't think that it's taken the guise or we don't have any equivalent of the plaques that commemorate and condemn uh, the deportations. We right. don't have, you know. A, As a collective memory, that's really interesting. And research have really changed right. that. And, now if, and I went to Monticello 30 years ago, then I went last year and then this year, a couple of weeks ago. But oh, there's good, a new yeah. exhibit. And right. Said, and said, and yeah, I was reading ways, about that. Yeah. I had to be a little bit, I was taken aback. I said, it's a, it's a bit of an American event to go there. And it's like, and they added new attractions. And in a horrible way, you sort of really think, oh, no, they expanded there. <laughs> and now they have to acknowledge yeah. what happened there, that yeah. in Slate they had a life too, and actually they're getting more accurate. So I think you're right. There's possibly a way to become more aware, but it hasn't reached the level of our nation. Yeah. For example, in other countries, like in Australia, they were Kevin Wright instituted Sorry Day, which was an apology to Native Americans, yeah. or Justin Trudeau in Canada has apologized to the treatment yeah. of especially Native people, Indigenous peoples, but also LGBT uh, people. Yeah. So in some ways, these national acts, they're not uh, quite, can't quite see them happening right now in America. And But to go back yeah, to this other point... You're, you're right. I also think that in some ways, the way that we engage in these collective memory practices is to avoid forming a collective moral judgment about right. it. That is, we collect information and we <laughs> and it doesn't we become a value exhibits. proposition. Yeah. It's, sort but, of, it's uh, informative and we know our history, but it doesn't mean we now have a value necessarily that's shared by everybody. Yeah. And I don't know. Part of it might be a desire to be neutral, but arguably it's also that 
there's a certain romanticization of certainly our founding fathers. We acknowledge that they were slaveholders and that they held many views that are repugnant to what we think of as our constitutional values. Which is what the battle is. We have not gotten to the point of really condemning or even describing the relationship with some of the female slaves as rape or sexual violence. Under horrific conditions of subjugation that also not just are horrific and need to be known and recognized as such, that for 200 years people actually wrote countless histories and biographies and mm-hmm. never acknowledged them. Right. So I've asked Annette Gordon-Reed once, why did people actually sit? They had the same archival material. They had knowledge. Yeah. They heard, you know, the son gave a testimony that, of course, no one believed because it was an African-American in the 1850s. Right. So we read documents that we didn't believe. Mm-hmm. So this is a larger question of yeah. how do you create a self-understanding for a country But there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. So one thing with many European constitutional orders is that they've reconstituted themselves after war and after the Holocaust. And it wasn't a complete reconstruction. In Germany, for example, there's the basic law, you know, which gets debated in the Parliamentary Assembly in 1948 and is adopted in 1949. And it, it is a new constitution for West Germany on the one hand, but it draws largely on the text of the Weimar Constitution from 1919 and a lot of the provisions, including the equality provision with some changes, but a a lot of the bare bones constitution from Weimar survives into the Bonn Constitution. But but it is a new moment, a new moment of constitution making. And there are healthy practices, I think, in a lot of other constitutional democracies, particularly in Western Europe, which are the ones I'm most familiar with, with amending the Constitution when values change. Hmm. Whereas I think we have a real reverence for the founding. <laughs> right. And, and even though we had a civil war and a new, arguably a new Constitution after the civil war, we, we acknowledge great continuity with the past And we don't have, I mean, part of it is that we have a constitutional text that makes it so hard to amend the Constitution, Article 5. And so as a result, any kind of constitutional change that we get comes from the judiciary, which are, you know, the legal elites. And so I I don't think we have healthy practices around remaking ourselves and acknowledging that values have changed, acknowledging that the founding fathers are not worthy of the reverence that we give them today. It's kind of sacrilege to absolutely. <laughs> it's actually also to say that about it's, the founding fathers. It's fact. even blasphemy yeah. to say that maybe the First Amendment doesn't work um, in all situations right. and probably one equally. And Elena Justice Kagan and the the dissent on the Janus decision that um, mm-hmm. HR, your colleague, read yesterday to me. She said at the end of the dissent, she says, the First Amendment has been turned into a sword, mm-hmm. and it wasn't meant always to do such things. Yeah. Way. So she said it's weaponized, and it's going to be weaponized in the wrong yeah. direction. Right. Not to give us all freedom, but in some ways to empower certain kind of structures of power that are not fair. Yeah. So, so it's so, as you said, the constitution is indeterminate in a powerful, creative sense for a country that had to form itself. But yeah, that leaves it up to you said the judiciary. I think I also hope citizens to actually challenge the way in which they make decisions. I think that they're very interested in this. That the Supreme Court and judges don't determine every part of our lives. Yeah. There's this interplay between what you're saying, that society changes, we have demographic shifts, our values may be different. Mm-hmm. How can that become expressed in, in legal practice? Yeah. I want to thank you. This is Professor Julie Sook at the Cardozo Law School. So thank you so much. We could have gone on for yeah, a long time. Absolutely. Thank and you. Thank you and good luck with your, uh, your current writing projects. And thank you for taking time out in the summer. I know it's, a, it's really a time of focusing. <laughs> Thank you. And I hope to speak to you again. Thank you. Absolutely.